Always. We ask the question. What is needed in the world? Kakvi su historijski odnosi Rusije prema Ukrajini? Zašto je Sovjetskom savezu bila važna Ukrajina? Koliko je precizno porediti Putinovo invaziju Ukrajine sa Hitlerovom aneksijom Češke? Da li će Rusija stati kada se kopneno spoji sa Krimom ili želi promjenu režima u Kijevu? Za Al Jazeera govori Omer Bartov, profesor historije na Univerzitetu Brown i jedan od vodeće istručnjaka za holokaust u Ukrajini. So, Professor Omer Bartov, hello and welcome to the Al Jazeera Balkans channel and thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. Now, um, Russian President Vladimir Putin explained that the goal of invading Ukraine was to protect the people that are subjected to abuse and genocide from the Kiev regime and to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. Now, what do you, as someone who has been studying European history in the Holocaust for many, many years, what do you understand by denazification and the context that President Putin uses it in? Well, um, thank you for having me um, for this discussion. I would say that um, uh, Putin's narrative is a totally Orwellian one. Uh, there is no Nazi regime in Ukraine. Ukraine happens to have a uh, a president of a Jewish background and a prime minister of a Jewish background. And um, Ukraine has become a democratic country and a rather diverse one. Uh, so this narrative is, is, is completely false. But I would say that Putin is trying to put this out and not entirely ineffectively, first of all, to his own population, particularly those parts of the Russian population that are less connected to social media and news uh, um, from elsewhere, and to connect it to a narrative of World War II, of what the Russians call the Great Patriotic War, and to the idea that Russia, or at the time the Soviet Union, were engaged in ridding the, the world of fascism and Nazism, which is completely true. Um, but of course, it, in, in the present context, this is simply an attempt to justify the unjustifiable. Unju well, that was exactly, exactly my next question. I mean, the, the Soviet Union helped uh, the Allies defeat the Nazis. Uh, there were more than 20 million casualties, as far as I remember. Uh, and the memory of fighting uh, still lives on in the region. So um, does using a term like denazification uh, resonate deeply with Putin's uh, domestic audience? It seems that it, that it resonates with parts of the Russian population, I would say, probably the older sectors of um, Russian right. society, the rural ones, uh, the less educated ones, those who are still watching television. Um, I don't think it resonates with the younger sectors of the Russian population. And I don't think it has much purchase uh, elsewhere at all. In some ways, um, it really um, reflects on Putin's own policy as a policy of, of conquest, domination, and oppression. So to use this sort of term really sheds uh, a particularly lamentable light on uh, Russian policy itself, I would say. Right, but Professor, why would uh, President Vladimir Putin, who presides over the largest country in the world, which spans over 11 time zones, still be interested in expanding his quote-unquote empire? Well, 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 that is the most important question. And I would say that, uh, you know, some commentators have said that uh, Putin was devastated by the end of the Soviet Union. He presented it as the greatest tragedy of the 20th century. Uh, and that he, what he wants to do is to resurrect uh, the Soviet Union. I actually think that um, his goal is to resurrect the Russian Empire. I don't think he has much love lost for the Soviet Union, and he's been rather critical of that. But he has a concept which was put out by the Russian government uh, of reuniting, first of all, Russia itself. And Russia, as he perceives it, is not just Great Russia, that is Russia of the Great Russians, but also White Russia, which is Belarus, and little Russia, which is Ukraine. And once those three Russias are part of a unified Russian state, then he can start talking also about the traditional 
um, Russian spheres of influence, which include not only Slavic peoples, but also those on the peripheries of that empire. So I would say that is what he sees as his historical goal. Um, and that is what he's trying to accomplish right now. I would like to talk about uh, Russia's <clears throat> interest in, in Balkan Slavs, but at a later moment. However, before that, um, a number of historians have stated that the excuses President Putin uses to justify his wars, his, um, his toolbox of threats, uh, coercive diplomacy, deception, and military force uh, seem to be far too reminiscent of Adolf Hitler's tactics and rhetoric. Um, would you compare his territorial aspirations towards Ukraine with Hitler's annexation of, of parts of the Czech Republic and Austria back in the 19, 1930s? Well, look, I mean, I think there are some similarities. I'm, I'm always reluctant to use the sort of Hitler analogy because it's an analogy that is uh, used by everyone and by right. every side and is usually uh, filled with inaccuracies. What, what is, as I said, for, for Putin, the view of Belarus and of Ukraine is not of uh, nations that have minorities, but rather of nations that belong uh, directly to, to the Russian Empire. Where this might um, play a larger role is if, uh, uh, and I hope he's not, but if he's successful in the case of Ukraine, is to, to start speaking about Russian minorities in other countries. And one can envision that being applied say, to the Baltic countries, where there are large Russian minorities, and to make such claims as he made about eastern Ukraine, that there's genocide against these um, um, ethnic Russian minorities. And that is, of course, very similar to arguments that were made by Hitler, um, first about Austria, then about Czechoslovakia, then about Poland, and so forth. Uh, so that is where I think there's a similarity. Right. Um has the West's past appeasement of, of President Vladimir Putin uh, made him in some ways delusional amid his uh, ongoing war against Ukraine? Yes, I think so. And why? I think, why, why has he become delusional out of that? Or why yeah. is there appeasement? Why has he become delusional? Well, I think he, he tries, like, like every man in his position, and every tyrant, every dictator, um, he, tr he is trying to see how far he can go. And he has been able to go pretty far in, in uh, Georgia, in um, Crimea, in eastern Ukraine. And this is the first time, really, um, possibly to his surprise, that finally the EU, NATO, the United States have said stop. And even now, they are playing very much to his kind of um, um, pack of cards where they're saying, well, we can uh, help Ukraine, but we can't really participate too much because he has nuclear weapons. And that is exactly how he can continue these policies. So yes, I think there is still an element of appeasement. And I think that uh, uh, Zelensky, the Ukrainian president, is right in saying that if um, the West waits long enough, by the time they will eventually intervene, and by then it may be way too late, and Putin will be emboldened to continue moving into other parts of Europe. Well, so you don't think that Putin will stop in Ukraine? Do you, th do you see the pos possibilities of him carrying out similar military operations um, in, in Moldova, further uh, military interventions in Georgia, even perhaps in the, in the Western Balkans? Absolutely. And that's exactly, you're absolutely right, I think. Uh, these are exactly the territories. First of all, he will try in areas that are not um, part of NATO. Uh, so, so that would be, since he already has forces in Transnistria, that, that would have to do with the Moldova. It may have to do with Georgia. I think one argument that he may come up with is regarding Kaliningrad, if you want another parallel with World War II, with the Polish corridor, that Russia needs a corridor to Kaliningrad, which once was Königsberg, uh, and now is a Russian territory that is separated from the rest of Russia, but that corridor would have to pass through Lithuania or Poland. 
So I think all these arguments will be made if he feels that he succeeded in Ukraine. Right. What about the Balkans? And how would you explain the historical interest of Tsarist Russia of having some sort of access uh, to the Adriatic Sea? And uh, how would you explain their relations with Orthodox Christian Slavs in this region? Yes. So, as I said, I mean, this, this, this indeed goes back to Russian policies long before the Soviet Union. Uh, one, one cardinal aspect of Russian policy uh, since the 18th century was, was, was to have warm water ports. Uh, and so that is, first of all, the, the interest in the Black Sea coast and possibly outside of the Black Sea, also in the Mediterranean proper. Uh, and the arguments about that has been the solidarity of Slavs, so Russians and Southern Slavs, and of course, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, uh, those of the Orthodox persuasion. And I do believe that it, he will have a case to make, it appears, I'm not on the ground there, but it appears that there's a fair amount of support for Putin in uh, Serbia and that he would uh, try to make use of that in uh, future attempts to expand Russian power to the West. Now, Professor, um, is Putin's war against Ukraine a, a watershed moment for Europe? I mean, does it bring the US and Europe closer together? Does it mute internal discord within the European Union? Uh, does it make clear that NATO is not, as French President Emmanuel Macron recently suggested, brain dead, and that it is in fact Europe's ultimate guarantor of peace and stability? Yes, you know, I mean, Putin succeeded in uh, unifying uh, the EU, in unifying NATO and showing that it is needed, in showing that what the former American president, Donald Trump, said was vacuous, that in fact, uh, there is a need for NATO. And of course, NATO can really be effective only when the United States is part of it. So in that sense, he has gotten exactly the opposite result of what he wanted. The question is whether NATO can uh, remain determined in realizing that something has fundamentally changed, that the, the, the international order that was put into place after World War II and that was then um, adapted to the conditions of the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991 uh, that that order has now been significantly threatened. And um, in order to maintain it, uh, there has to be a great deal of rethinking and a great deal of sacrifice uh, by politicians uh, and by the nations that they're in charge of. Mm -hmm. um, is Russia really trying to erect a new Iron Curtain, as some have suggested, with its satellites and um, on one side in the so-called free world, uh, on the other side, does that metaphor still hold today? Well, it's, I think it's complicated because I don't, I think part of Russia's success uh, under Putin and his success within Russia was the westernization of Russia, or especially, um, and, and most importantly, of Russian elites and of the Russian middle class. And that had to do with undoing the Iron Curtain. Now, resurrecting the Iron Curtain, isolating Russia, uh, I think will cost Putin the support of those who supported him, not necessarily because they liked him or liked his policies, but because they felt that they benefited from it. Uh, so in that sense, um, I'm not sure that this is what he would like to do, but it appears that he is looking to create something that is more similar to what China has created, where uh, there's a large new middle class that has greatly benefited uh, from opening up, and yet that the social media and all the other media are very closely controlled. Whether Putin can accomplish what the Chinese accomplished is, I think, a question. I'm not sure that he can do that. Right. But do you think these uh, Western sanctions will alienate the middle class from Putin? I think so. I think in the long run, yes. But my sense is that uh, um, Putin will not go away because uh, the middle class is alienated from him. Uh, I think uh, the only possibility of Putin being removed is because the elites around him 
those that really are his 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 levers of power will decide that they're losing too much. Uh, and that's um, that will not be for the first time in Russian history, whether Tsarist history or communist history, that those who surround the leader, uh, they, they don't want to come to the leader and tell the leader, listen, your policies are really not working because they're afraid uh, for their heads. Uh, but at some point, they will just come and escort him out. And I think that's uh, where the threat for Putin is. Uh, I don't think he's worried right now about uh, guys in Moscow complaining that they can't use Apple Pay anymore. Right. Um, but so uh, looking at things from a broader perspective, are we going to see a far more divided and polarized world and a far more militarized Europe? Yes, and you know, the, um, the, one of the most extraordinary results of the invasion of Ukraine was the change in German policy. Uh, uh, Germany uh, completely made a total uh, uh, turnabout, both in its energy policy and in its military policy. It's greatly expanded its, uh, its uh, budget uh, for uh, the military. Uh, it is supplying uh, Ukraine with arms. This is something that hasn't happened since uh, World War II. And I think that that indicates, because Germany is the, 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 the most uh, powerful uh, country within NATO after the United States, I think that um, shows a, a dramatic change in policy that will mean greatly strengthening NATO and thinking about a different kind of relationship uh, between NATO and Russia. Now, now the, the second part of it is, what then will be the relationship between these three um, uh, blocks, that is NATO, Russia, and China, and the possibility, which I'm not sure enough people are talking about, is that uh, Putin has maneuvered Russia into becoming a kind of vassal state of China, because it is China that is the real economic power, the real rising power, whereas Russia economically is really, and has been for a long time, a declining power. Um, but it is now a sort of um, three-block world with a great deal of tensions between these three blocks. Right. Perhaps it's also worth mentioning that even if the EU were to stop uh, purchasing Russian gas, uh, China is, has, is very much energy hungry and Russia is much more willing to divert its gas supplies towards China uh, at this moment. Um, now, moving on to how the EU, EU has resp responded, um, does Europe's unified welcome of Ukrainian refugees uh, expose double standards um, for non-white asylum seekers? It does. I mean, and I, th I think there's no question about it. Um, Why has uh, it been so, so obvious? Well, it's, it's obvious in the sense that if you look uh, at how East European countries uh, responding to the refugee crisis from Syria, uh, they were entirely opposed to that. And right now, uh, Poland has taken in, I think, about a million refugees from yes. Ukraine. Uh, so in that sense, yes, there is a sense of a greater um, cultural, religious uh, affinity uh, toward Ukrainians uh, than there was regarding refugees from Syria. I think that's, th there's no question about it. Um, I, I would add, however, that it is not as natural as it seems, for instance, for Poland to open its borders to Ukraine. Um, there, there, there had been a lot ongoing um, tensions uh, and conflict between Poland and Ukraine, and Poland for a long time presented itself as the end of the West, what was East of Poland was already part of it, um, non-European, was outside of Europe. So this is quite a shift within Polish uh, policies uh, themselves and the same, I would say, with Hungary, which is a very interesting case where Hungary was much closer to Russia and to Putin, both because of his policies uh, and because of its own sense of isolation in a Slavic world. And now it has shifted its policies. Um, so I think, look, I mean, generally countries willing to take in refugees is something that should be lauded and not criticized. But it is true 
that uh, during the refugee crisis uh, from uh, Syria, it was only Germany that opened up its gates to a million refugees, and that came at a high political cost within Germany itself. Right. Um, and you're also somebody who has also been dealing with, uh, with uh, the Middle East, precisely with Israel and Palestine. Um, I would like to ask you, what does the war in Ukraine uh, mean for Israel? Um, while thousands of Israelis have demonstrated uh, in support of Ukraine, uh, the Israeli government's um, reaction has been somewhat measured, if not muted. Um, is Israel trying to balance uh, its support, its backing of Ukrainians, and uh, at the same time, not, not wanting to offend Russia? I think so. You know, it's a, it's a very complicated situation in Israel. And I would say just briefly that there are domestic reasons for this policy that is a, 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 is a bit hard to defend. Uh, and there are foreign um, or military reasons for this. The domestic reasons are <clears throat> Israel has a, a, a very large uh, population from Russia. They, they are called Russians in Israel, but most of them came from Ukraine. Um, and, and, and not all of them are Jewish, by the way. Many are right. family members who are not Jewish. Um, those, um, that po population, by and large, uh, has affinities with Russia and with Russian culture, much more than with Ukraine, and had internalized uh, many of the Russian prejudices about Ukrainians, those so-called little Russians. Uh, right. And so that's that's one issue. Uh, and the government has to uh, face up to that. The second and possibly the more important is that Israel, of course, has interests north of Israel, uh, particularly in Syria, especially regarding Hezbollah and regarding um, the Iranian presence there. And because the United States did not want to get involved in, in Syria and open the door to Russia, Russia basically has superiority or control over the air in, in that area. And apparently Russia has not allowed uh, Syria to use its own sophisticated Russian delivered uh, anti-air missiles against Israeli aircraft and has not uh, used its own aircraft to um, uh, prevent uh, Israeli aerial attacks on targets of Hezbollah and of uh, and Iranian targets. Now, if Israel were to say, uh, provide elements of Iron Dome to Ukraine, that Russia could easily uh, change its policy. So I think this has to do with what would be called small state policies. Israel has to recognize the limits of its power, and it has to maneuver between supporting American and EU policies on the other hand, and not alienating Russia too much on the other. All right. Professor, as, as my final question, um, what do you think are the most likely scenarios when it comes to uh, to the war in Ukraine, uh, do you see this, this as being a, uh, as resulting in a in a protracted conflict, a uh, short-term war, or perhaps a frozen conflict, as some have recently suggested? It's really hard to tell at the moment. I must say, I'm, I'm, I've been asking myself the same question. Um, I don't think that Russia will be able simply to take over Ukraine. Uh, people don't talk much about it, but in uh, Ukraine, there's a tradition of insurgency. There was an ongoing insurgency against the Red Army when it liberated Ukraine. Most Ukrainians did not feel, certainly not Western Ukrainians, did not feel liberated by the, by the Red Army, but reoccupied in 1944. And there was an insurgency there that went on until the end of the 1940s, long after the end of World War II. I think Ukrainians will continue to resist. Um, but whether there will be some resolution before that, I think Russia is in such dire economic straits that um, Putin will be looking for some kind of resolution. Whether Ukraine will accept it, I don't know. I think it's very hard to say. So it could be a protracted conflict unless the pressure on Russia is too great and Ukraine is helped which I think it must be uh, more than now uh, in its military resistance, including supplying it with aircraft against which all kinds of arguments have been made that I don't find persuasive. Right. On that note, Professor Omer Bartov, it was a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Always. We ask the question. What is the world?